subscribe our channel to get the latest practice material. Tomorrow is April 20th, 420. It's sometimes called a high holiday. Because for a lot of people, 420 is marijuana day. And for them it's kind of a tradition to start lighting up at 4.20 p.m. on April 20th which led a couple of researchers in Canada to wonder if there was any evidence for an increase in traffic deaths related to the occasion. They got access to the United States National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's Fatality Analysis Reporting System which tracks all public road accidents in which at least one person died. And they looked at the numbers on April 20th from 4.20 p.m. through midnight from 1992 through 2016. They also examined traffic deaths related to accidents on the day one week earlier and the day one week later during the same hours. The result, a 12% increase in fatalities related to traffic accidents on April 20th after 4.20 p.m. compared with the control dates. And for drivers 20 and under the figure was much higher, more than a 30% increase in some states. The research is in the journal JAMA Internal Medicine. Of course, this study does not prove that impaired driving caused by marijuana consumption was the cause of the higher death rate. For example, could be that drivers crash while simply trying to light up. Scientific American has long supported making it easier for researchers to study marijuana's medicinal effects as well as decriminalization in general. But we're still against driving while intoxicated, so if you're gonna be toking, keep those pistons from stroking. The pistons in the engine. Google and Facebook both do a nice job identifying your friends and photos, a testament to how good machines have gotten at studying human faces. But how well would an algorithm fare, when pitted against a forensic facial examiner? The experts that testify in court? Well it turns out the best algorithm is comparable to the best humans. Jonathan Phillips, a facial recognition scientist at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. He and his colleagues presented 20 very difficult image pairs to human experts, and a range of algorithms. And the most up-to-date algorithms did indeed perform as well as the skilled humans. But when Phillips and his team asked for input from two humans, or a human and an algorithm, it was the combined judgment of humans and machines that won out, providing near-perfect results which suggests the pooled strengths and weaknesses of human brains and computer code add up to superior accuracy. The study is in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Phillips says now it's now up to the facial recognition community to use these findings to improve the tests in real-world settings. And don't worry, human recognizers won't be out of a job anytime soon. Just because an algorithm says I give you a high score you don't just accept the word of that black box. You develop ways of integrating human judgment into the decision you get out of an algorithm itself. After all someone, preferably, a human still has to explain the findings in court.
When you burn your tongue or cut your cheek, the pain can be intense. But the wound heals pretty quickly, compared to injuries elsewhere. That's because all the factors needed to repair a wound are ready to jump into action in oral tissue, because a new study shows that proteins called transcription factors, which control all those healing elements, are present at greater levels in the mouth. You can think of those controlling proteins as theater directors dot in the healing factors as the actors, waiting in the wings. They are ready to go, right on the sidelines, in the oral epithelia, so the director says, come ahead and then they are just right on stage. Maria Marasso, a senior investigator at the National Institutes of Health. She says that's not the case in regular skin tissue. They have the capability of coming on stage. But they're nowhere close, so you have to go through that step of getting them on stage to go ahead with that function. Which delays healing. It might be difficult to have the play finish on time and according to the script. The study is in the journal Science Translational Medicine. Marasso and her colleagues also tested this idea by genetically engineering mice to have more of those factors, the directors, in their regular skin tissue, and sure enough, those mice had significantly faster skin wound healing than did control mice. But we can genetically engineer humans. Instead, Marasso says, if we can learn more about who the healing actors are, then perhaps we can find targeted ways of sending those individuals on stage to deliver better performance for patients. People speak thousands of languages in the world today. And same goes for the bird world. Each bird species has effectively its own language. Andy Radford, a professor of behavioral ecology at the University of Bristol. And there might be similarities between some languages just as there are in the human world. And then there are other languages that sound extremely different, even though they're conveying exactly the same meaning. In fact, some birds are known to pick up on the language of other species. In particular, they've learned to detect danger by eavesdropping on the alarm calls of other birds. Radford and his colleagues wanted to investigate how that learning occurs. So they first played an alarm call that fairy wrens, an Australian bird, shouldn't be familiar with. A computer generated alarm call meant to mimic a bird's. As expected, the unfamiliar sound had no effect on the fairy wrens. But then the researchers paired the synthetic call with a chorus of alarm calls the wrens would recognize. Chorus and after the training, the sound of the initially unfamiliar synthetic call alone synthetic call was enough to send the birds ducking for cover. The results are in the journal Current Biology. Radford says the study shows birds can learn from their peers, without ever seeing them dot or predator either. And so I think that's the coolest thing of all, is that you can learn with your eyes shut about something really important in the natural world.
Climate change means springtimes are arriving earlier across North America. But the season's onset isn't changing at the same rate across the nation. Spring is not advancing as quickly in southern regions as it is in northern regions. Eric Waller, a biogeographer at the U.S. Geological Survey, he and his team analyzed more than a hundred years of data on when the first leaves and flowers emerge across North America each spring. And they found that although spring has sprung earlier nearly everywhere, in certain wildlife refuges, the season hits extremely early. And that mismatch could be a problem for migratory birds, who might leave their temperate overwintering grounds down south at the usual time, only to find out they've arrived up north too late. Their food resources might be withering and they might not have as much food available to them. And that could affect their reproduction, their breeding. The analysis is in the journal Blows One. The upshot, it may be more difficult than we thought to predict the effects of climate change on migratory birds. But the data might help land managers decide which plots of land to acquire, to augment existing reserves, and in doing so, ensure that even later birds still get the worm. I am very aware of the preciousness of time. I was given two to three years to live. I faced a life unable to properly communicate. Fortunately, my mind was unaffected. While all around me people had passed away, deep in conversation I have often been transferred into her lost inside my own thoughts, trying to fathom how the universe works. Perhaps, it is human nature that we adapt and survive. We have this one life to appreciate the grand design of the universe. There is still plenty more to find out. We are all time travelers, journeying together into the future. Let us work together to make that future a place we want to visit. I am convinced that humans need to leave Earth and make a new home on another planet. In the next 100 years, we will embark on our greatest ever adventure. Our destiny is in the stars. So remember to look up at the stars and not down at your feet. Try to make sense of what you see and wonder about what makes the universe exist. You can find house cats on every continent except Antarctica, but that wasn't always the case. How did cats make it across oceans and into households worldwide? The secret lies in an ancient cat DNA. Here's how cats spread across the world. It started around 10,000 years ago in what's now modern-day Turkey. DNA analysis shows this is where cats' wild ancestors likely originated. Wild cats proved to be effective rodent control for early farmers, as the agricultural revolution spread. Cats joined for the ride by 2500 BC. Cats had reached Cyprus where no cats had existed before. Over the next few thousand years they accompanied humans north into Bulgaria and Romania. By 800 BC cats had found their calling in Egypt. Cats weren't just an object of worship here, 
Egyptian cats specifically became popular among other groups like the Romans and Vikings who brought cats on their ships for pest control. These two groups took the feline revolution by storm helping cats spread across all of Africa, Europe and Asia. By the time Europeans were sailing to the Americas, cats were common shipmates. Today one-third of American homes have at least one cat that's about 93.5 million house cats in the U.S. alone now that they've conquered the world of human side, cats can rest easy. We have briefly looked at some of the problems involved running a bigger city like say Melbourne, keeping the road rail systems running, placing, providing food, and housing and so on. In another lecture, I'm going to deal with we must now call the megalopolis, cities with populations of 10 million or more. However, first I want to go back in history to when the population of cities could be numbered in the thousands rather than millions. One of the earliest theorists of the city was of course, Plato who created an ideal city in his text The Republic. The population of the city would be around 25 to 30,000 at the most, oddly enough the same figures were chosen by Leonardo da Vinci for his ideal cities. Now, of these 25 to 30,000 inhabitants only about 5,000 would be citizens. A reason for this might be that it is the largest number that could be addressed publicly at one time and by one person, and makes the voting systems much easier to manage. Also, perhaps the numbers are kept deliberately low because a large population would be hard to control. All because in practical terms a few inhabitants are easy to feed from local suppliers without having to depend on outside sources. There was a time when the subject of happiness was the business of philosophers as part of their discussion of what makes for a good life, then much later psychologists and sociologists got in on the act, and now it seems so is the government. I understand that the government should have the welfare and well-being of those it governs at heart. From the purely practical point of view of keeping people quiet at home enjoying their gadgets and comfort rather than on the street riding, which surely it's not something you can legislate for. Today there are numerous journals on the topics and is even included in the curriculum of some universities and colleges, surveys are done, statistics compiled, graph drawn, yet all they seem to prove is what most people have concluded themselves from personal experience. An obvious example would be that having a lot of money doesn't necessarily make you happy. We all wish to be happy and have ideas about what it is we think would make so. But we also know or suspect it's not that easy. Most of us learn that it is a byproduct of something else, usually being totally absorbed or involved in some task or pastime and can only be reached that way. These activities of course must be worthwhile in themselves.
Machiavelli lived from 1469 to 1527. Philosopher Bertrand Russell referred to Machiavelli's most well-known book The Prince as a Gangster's Handbook. And while there is no doubt that certain people have rate and used as such, I think that if we put it into the context of when it was written, which was Italy especially Florence, in the 15th and 16th centuries, it will be easier to judge Machiavelli's reasons for writing. Now, Italy of that period was made up of a number of city-states off in war with each other, added to that threats from foreign powers especially France and it was a very unstable and dangerous situation. Machiavelli loved his home city, Florence, and wanted to protect its culture history and above all independence at all costs. One way to do this was to establish an army of Florentines loyal to the city, state of Florence. Much of Machiavelli's career was taken up with this issue. It must be remembered though that he led an active civic life with deeply into politics and was an ambassador for Florence. In this way he got to meet and observe some of the key players of the time and through this came to understand the nature of power and how to hold on to it. The prince was an attempt to teach Florence the lessons he had learned. I suppose that it has always been the case for the majority of us that the first test of a work of art or literature or music is how much pleasure it gives us and we don't want to bother with analyzing why or how it has had such an emotional impact on us. It is good to know what your pleasures are in the positive sense and not as easy as some people think as opposed to only really knowing what you don't like and complaining about it, though presumably is some kind of pleasure to be had from that too. But now that you've chosen to take a course on the novel, I am afraid evaluating literature on the basis of how you feel about a book won't count as intelligent critical response to the work being studied. It is however useful to remind yourselves from time to time that we all fall for trash every now and again, for instance you might actually enjoy listening to a catchy pop song but you will find it hard to explain in critical terms it is good or better than something else, just because it is enjoyable. So you are here to sharpen up your critical knives at work among other things of course. It is almost impossible these days not to include photography in a course on the history of art. I disagree with people such as Walter Benjamin, who suggests that technology and art don't go well together. Photography with its realism, its accurate representation of the thing in front of you, initially deprived many artists of their subject matter, forcing him to look in new ways. No bad thing. True, as produced images say, the Mona Lisa obviously can't provide the same experience as seeing the real painting. On the other hand, there are photographs, which to my mind are far more provoking and have great emotional impact than a painting of the same subject ever could. Some people say that the traditional idea of an artist with a trained hand is old-fashioned. We no longer believe that an artist needs its specialist knowledge but rather that he or she can simply point the camera at the scene and record it. 
however, on the one hand that ignores the creative skill involved in producing photograph on the other hand, it also ignores the fact that even in the past painters used in various technological aids, for example the Dutch painter Vermeer, used a camera obscura to help him create his images. We'll go into that later, but for now, I want to look at the documentary and cultural value of photography. Alexis de Tocqueville, as we have noted, appears to have had some appeal to both ends of the political spectrum, left and right, or rather, both have found him to be useful for their purposes in certain circumstances. His rational acceptance of the new forces of democracy brought about by the American and French revolutions made him an icon of left-wing liberals. However, during the Cold War, that is, from the end of World War II until the collapse of communism, he was adopted by some leading thinkers on the right. So. There are two sides to his political philosophy, and the man himself, that we need to look at now. I would suggest that de Tocqueville's biography is important here. You must always bear in mind when reading him that he was an aristocrat, and one whose family had suffered in the French Revolution. He wasn't your typical aristocrat because his politics differed from others of his family and social rank. He abandoned the Catholic Church and married beneath his class. Yet he never quite threw off the prejudices of that class. However, and what is important, he did recognize and believe that the tendency of history, which in those days could be traced back to the Middle Ages, was towards the leveling of social ranks, and more equal and democratic conditions. The French Revolution had in the end brought Napoleon, whom he hated, but democracy would inevitably come to France. His trip to America was to see democracy in practice, make note of its shortcomings and errors, and then find safeguards against them. Now, you might think it strange that in a lecture on biology, I will be talking a lot about mathematics. If I may digress a bit, when I was a student, mathematics, the language of clear abstraction, had nothing to do with life sciences like biology, the sphere of messy organic forms, cutting up frogs in the lab, and so on. Um, in fact, I started doing biology precisely to avoid math and physics. So, I've had a lot of catching up to do. We are all aware of how the sciences have come to interrelate more and more, and not only will mathematics impinge more and more on biology but also, I am told, in the 21st century, the driving force behind mathematics will be biology. This is partly because mathematicians are always on the lookout for more areas to conquer. But a far greater reason is that the subject has been boiled down to physics and chemistry, obvious attractions for mathematicians. A number of mathematical fields can be applied to biology. For example, Knot theory is used in the analysis of the tangled strands of DNA, an abstract geometry in four or more dimensions is used to tell us about viruses. Again, 
neuroscience appears to be mass friendly and equations can also explain why hallucinogenic drugs cause the users to see spirals. So, if mathematicians are taking such a keen interest in biology, the least we can do as biologists is return the compliment. So, continuing our series of lectures on modernism, we now turn to architecture and, in particular, to the work of Frank O'Gary. Now, I'm not going to go into his career in detail. It is enough to say that early on he was, like other modernist architects, tied to the rectangle, the straight line, and so on. Often their buildings would have this basic shape and they would just add bits of decoration like splashes of color or pointless balconies. Soon enough, Gary wanted to break away from straight lines and grid line designs. He wanted the freedom to experiment with other shapes curves and unusually angled roofs. What helped him with this was the computer, which allowed him to visualize and experiment with complex shapes, and to work on the whole design as one piece, without the added decoration being thrown in as an afterthought. Architecture is art, if you like, or, or sculpture even. He himself said that he had struggled with crossing the line between architecture and sculpture. Now, I want to talk about one building in particular. The Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, which I think you will agree is a masterpiece. Most of what the general public knows about daily life in ancient Rome comes from art, architecture and literature, which tell us more about the elites, especially, the goings-on of the emperors. But how much do we know of the lives of ordinary Romans? Did they have a voice, a part, that is, from what we can gather from the graffiti? The usual picture is one of time spent at festivals, baths and, typically, the games. However, for many Romans, terrible living conditions, poverty, that and the chance of being sold into slavery at any moment, that is, if they weren't slaves already, left no time or energy for such forms of entertainment, or for any interesting politics, for that matter. Indeed, after the death of Augustus, executive power was taken from the elected assemblies of the Roman people. Now it was the emperor's job to look after the people, and his generosity often depended on the mood and behavior of the people, on how often and how violently they protested and rioted. One example would be Claudius ensuring a steady grain supply, even in winter, after rioters pelted him with stale crusts of bread. There is an anecdote about, Ern, Hadrian. While touring the provinces, an old lady approached him with a complaint, he made excuses and tried to get away. She said that if he wouldn't give her a hearing, he shouldn't be emperor. She got her hearing.
under appropriate conditions, sound receptors. You've got sound receptors in your ear and they are beautiful. We are not going to talk about them at any length, but there's little flapping. These little spiky things going along in your ear and they can translate vibrational energy coming from your ear. Hurting your eardrum, being translated into a vibration into the fluid in your ear into a physical motion of these little receptors there into an electrical motion, into an electrical signal that goes into your ear. So, all of that, all of that's pretty impressive stuff. We are not going to talk about the details of it. But I invite some of you who want to learn more about this, particularly MIT students. I think fine receptors really quite remarkable kinds of devices. I marveled at how often powerful feel powerless but in the face of this sense of disempowerment, there's no decline in involvement in organizations which seek to share wealth and opportunities, protect one another's rights and work towards the common good. According to the United Nations, civil society groups have grown 40-fold since the turn of last century. Internationally, the nonprofit sector is worth $1 trillion, and there are 700,000 such organizations in Australia alone. The UN recognizes 37,000 specifically civil society organizations across the globe, and gave 3,500 accreditation to the 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development. This profound movement towards harnessing voices and resources from outside the realm of governments and officialdom reflects a profound growth in NGOs, the third sector, as some call it. As Robert Putnam discovered in the field of local government in Italy, the best predictor of governmental success was the strength and density of a region's civic associations. Galaxies in a cluster roughly 300 million light years from Earth could contain as much as 100 times more dark matter than visible matter, according to an Australian study. The research, published today, used powerful computer simulations to study galaxies that have fallen into the coma cluster, one of the largest structures in the universe in which thousands of galaxies are bound together by gravity. It found the galaxies could have fallen into the cluster as early as 7 billion years ago, which if our current theories of galaxies' evolution are correct, suggests they must have lots of dark matter protecting the visible matter from being ripped apart by the cluster. Dark matter cannot be seen directly but the mysterious substance is thought to make up about 84% of the matter in the universe. International Center for Radio Astronomy Research PhD student Cameron Yozen, who led the study, says the paper demonstrates for the first time that some galaxies that have fallen into the cluster could plausibly have as much as 100 times more dark matter than visible matter. Yozen, who is based at the University of Western Australia, says the galaxies he studied in the coma cluster are about the same size as our own Milky Way but contain only 1% of the stars. 
He says the galaxies appear to have stopped making new stars when they first fell into the cluster between 7 and 10 billion years ago and have been dead ever since, leading astrophysicists to label them failed galaxies. I have been writing non-fiction for years, actually, and, but secretly wanting to be a novelist. When I first started writing at the age of 30, it was with the intention of writing fiction, but I took a little detour for 10 or 12 years and wrote non-fiction which I have absolutely no regret about it at all. I think it was exactly the right thing for me to do. But there was that dream tucked away inside of me to do this. Now remember reading something that Eudora Welty wrote, who is, you know, a great novelist from Mississippi who had a big influence on me actually. She said, no art ever came out of not risking your neck. And I think she's absolutely right about that. It felt that way to me at the time, it actually feels that way to me every time I sit down to write something. Finally, in the early 90s, I took my deep breath and started writing fiction. It felt risky to me at the time to do that. And one of the very first things I wrote was, what I thought was going to be the first chapter of a novel, called The Secret Life of Bees. I wrote it in 1992, and it is actually essentially the first chapter of the novel as it is now.